when two atoms interact, whether they're the same element or different elements, what really interacts are the electron clouds. So it's important for us to be able to make some predictions about how those electron clouds are going to interact with each other. The most important thing here is that when electron clouds interact, when atoms interact, what they're trying to do is achieve a stable electron configuration. Now, if we think about stability in electron configurations, the most stable electron configurations that we come across in the periodic table are those of the noble gases. Noble gases are very unreactive, and the reason they're unreactive is because they have a very stable electron configuration. When we've got something that's not a noble gas, one way to get to a stable noble gas electron configuration is by either giving away extra electrons or adding deficient electrons. Now, we have to be a little careful here because electrons can't just arbitrarily be gained and lost. I, I don't have a, a jar full of electrons to do chemistry with. So when we're talking about things gaining and losing electrons, we have to understand that both of those processes have to occur. And when we gain or lose electrons, we end up with charged species called ions. And those ions form ionic compounds that have a balanced overall neutral charge. One way we can visualize these valence electrons, the outermost electrons uh, in an atom, is by using a Lewis dot structure, as shown here. So um, in, a, in a full outer shell of a chemical element, one, one way we can visualize that is by looking at uh, something called an octet. There are eight electrons uh, in a full shell. Um, so we can put those into a, a picture where we show the element and then add a dot for every electron. Now by convention we put those dots around, um, around the element symbol and pair them up so ultimately when it's full, like in neon, the noble gas, we've got eight electrons, four pairs of electrons around the neon. Notice as we add extra electrons, as we add electrons to this, we don't pair those electrons up until we have to, and that's an important aspect of the reactivity that we might see. So what happens when these interact? Well, here we, we can see from these Lewis dot pictures that if I've got something like lithium, if I want that to get to a stable full shell configuration, I just need to lose this one electron. So lithium tends to lose one electron and become lithium plus one. It loses a negative charge and is left with a plus one charge. If I go all the way to the other end where I'm at fluorine, fluorine has two, four, six, seven electrons already. So the easiest way for it to achieve that uh, octet rule, that full configuration, is by gaining one electron. When fluorine gains one electron, it becomes uh, F minus. It becomes a fluoride ion. We can use the periodic table to predict a bunch of these charges. So lithium and all of the other elements in the same column as lithium have one valence electron more than a full shell. So they can all lose one valence electron and be plus one charge. The next column over, magnesium, I'm not sure why they don't have beryllium shown here, but uh, beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium, these all have two valence electrons. If you lose those two valence electrons, you get to a stable noble gas configuration, you have a plus two ion. Once we get into the transition metals and a lot of other metals, things can vary a little bit more. It's not quite as straightforward as just losing everything to a noble gas configuration. But if we go all the way over to the other side, as we said with fluorine, if we add one electron to fluorine or chlorine or bromine or iodine, we get the negative one charged ion that has the same electron configuration as a noble gas. The next column over, oxygen gains two electrons to get to oxide or sulfur to sulfide or selenium to selenide. Nitrogen gains three to get to that noble gas configuration. So nitride phosphide means three. What kind of properties? How do we recognize something as being an ionic compound? Well, 
first of all, um, ionic compounds are made of ions, but we'll get back to that in a minute. Physically, if you look at ionic compounds, ionic compounds are usually, and usually is a very important word here because there are certainly plenty of exceptions, but many ionic compounds are crystalline. So they look like crystals. They're hard and brittle in many cases. Um, typically, ionic compounds melt and boil at a very high temperature, hundreds if not thousands of degrees. They're often soluble in water. Now, not always soluble in water, but they're often soluble in water. And when they dissolve in water, those solutions tend to conduct electricity, as do just molten uh, melts of uh, the ionic compound itself. All of these property, properties can be explained because ionic compounds are made of ions, oppositely charged ions that interact very strongly with each other. Opposite charges attract each other very strongly and give rise to a bunch of these properties. As I said, uh, we can recognize an ionic compound because it's made of ions. Usually, those ions are a metal and a non-metal in the periodic table. So things like sodium chloride, magnesium bromide. Um, another way we can recognize them is by the presence of a polyatomic ion. Polyatomic ions are always ions. So if a formula has a polyatomic ion, it has to be an ionic compound. Uh, we'll get back to polyatomic ions a little bit later. Um, another trick that we can use, another way we can recognize ionic compounds is if the two elements in the compound are relatively far apart on the periodic table. If you look at a periodic table and look at something like sodium chloride, sodium is all the way on the left, chloride is all the way on the right. So far apart on the periodic table tend to be ionic compounds. When we're naming these, Ionic compounds, uh, we typically name the cation, name the positively charged ion first, and the anion, the negatively charged ion, second. Um, if we're looking at single element anions, things like chloride, oxide, nitride, uh, they usually end in IDE. So chloride, Cl minus is a chloride ion. Now, we've got to be a little careful here because not everything that ends in IDE is a single element ion, but if something ends in IDE, there's a really, really, really good chance that it's going to be an anion, a negatively charged ion. One of the challenges that we've got when learning about ionic compounds is that the ionic compounds must be charge balanced. What does that mean? That means the total positive charge from the cations has to equal the total negative charge from the anions using the lowest whole number ratio of those cations at the end. So how do we get those balanced out? We've got to exactly equal or cancel out, sometimes called, or balance the charges. Um, so if we look at something like potassium sulfide, potassium, uh, if you're looking for it on the periodic table, it's, it's element K. Uh, atomic number is 19. Uh, potassium is a metal and it's in group one of the periodic table, so we expect it to be a plus one charge as an ion. Sulfide, atomic number 16, symbol is S, uh, is a non-metal, and uh, given where it is in the periodic table, we expect it to have a charge of negative two. It's in group 16. So to balance those charges, we need two, two potassium ions. Each has a plus one charge, so two of them gives us a plus two total charge, and one sulfide, uh, which has a negative two charge. So we write that as K2 because we need two potassiums S sulfide. Now there are a few other little things we've got to keep an eye on. Uh, one of them is cations with variable charges. Uh, I said that things like transition metals can have a number of different charges. They're not quite as predictable. How do we know what the charge is? Well, hopefully we've got uh, something that'll tell us. So something like F of the Cl3. Chloride is pretty reliably minus one. Um, when we're talking about chloride ion, it really can only have a charge of minus one. And if I've got three of those in this balanced formula, I've got three negative charges, so the iron must be plus three in order for this to be a balanced formula. 
how do I write that? I can't just write iron chloride because that doesn't communicate what this is. The way we designate those is with Roman numerals. We call this iron three chloride. Now, again, looking back at the periodic table, group one is pretty reliable. Uh, lithium, sodium, potassium are pretty reliable at plus one. Group two, uh, beryllium, magnesium, calcium, strontium, those are pretty reliable at plus two. Uh, aluminum is pretty much always plus three, and zinc is almost always plus two. But outside of those, most of the others uh, can have varying charge. So I'll usually designate most of the others uh, with this Roman numeral uh, descriptor. One of the other things that causes some challenge is when we write a balanced chemical formula, sometimes it looks like there's a diatomic element in there. So if we've got um, something like TiO2, this is titanium four oxide. Uh, it's a very common uh, industrial chemical uh, used in a lot of uh, a lot of different places. Uh, it's also the uh, mineral, what is it, luteal is a titanium dioxide. Um, but this is titanium four oxide. So titanium four, that's plus four, that means that these oxygens, even though it looks like an oxygen uh, molecule, O2, remember oxygen is one of those diatomics, this isn't an O2 and a neutral titanium. This is titanium and two oxide ions, each with a charge of minus two. So uh, this is one that I see come up uh, fairly often when, when trying to look at names and, and specifically naming chemical compounds. So, uh, keep in mind, when you're part of an ionic compound, uh, this isn't oxygen, an O2 molecule. This is two oxide ions. Working with ionic compounds uh, ultimately isn't that hard, but it's something that certainly takes a lot of practice to get used to. So give yourself every opportunity to practice. Look at product labels. Uh, product labels very often contain the names of ionic compounds. So uh, next time you've got a, a beverage of some sort, just take a look at the ingredient label and uh, oftentimes you can see some ionic compound names in there that you can try uh, writing formulas for. So practice, practice, practice. Uh, it's, it's how we get better at these things. See you next time.